Uh, we have a fantastic lecture here today with a phenomenal speaker, and I'm so excited to have the Slatopolsky lecture rejoin us this year. Uh, unfortunately, we missed them last year, secondary to COVID. And here to introduce our speaker in a moment will be Dr. Ben Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys did most of his training in the Boston area, including uh, Harvard Medical School, followed by Mass Gen and Brigham for his residency and fellowship. He is here with us now as the chief in our division of nephrology. Um, a few points to uh, remember, we have the online option available today. What we have some faces here in person, which is fantastic. It's nice to see some friendly eyes, if nothing else. And if you have any questions, obviously anyone here, feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, get those in person. But if you're online, put them in the Q&A section and I'll help moderate that with our speaker later in the talk as we go. If you missed any other previous talks or wanna review this talk, please come check us out at our Department of Medicine website and our brand new YouTube channel. And please, I just wanna thank everyone for not live tweeting this event or using any social media during the talk. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Humphreys. Well, thank you so much. It is really a distinct pleasure to be with you all today, uh, both in person and virtually for the Slatopolsky lecture. And it's uh, uh, my honor to really describe a little bit about the contributions of Dr. Eduardo Slatopolsky. You can see in this picture here in the front row, uh, uh, Mark Hammerman, my predecessor next to him, Mabel Perkerson, who co-founded Women in Nephrology, a society that's still thriving today. And then there in the middle is um, Eduardo, Dr. Slatopolsky, seated next to his colleague, mentor, and friend, Salo Klar, both of whom made enormous contributions to our understanding of kidney homeostasis and disease. And in part, Eduardo's discoveries were enabled through this rooster, El Macho, who um, aside from being a mean old bird produced some of the most sensitive antibodies to parathyroid hormone that actually traveled around the world and used by many laboratories. Believe it or not, he's still with us today in a corner of the renal division. And I think you can get a sense from his eye that this, this was a rare old bird not unlike um, the principal investigator himself, who was, as I mentioned, recognized for his many contributions over decades that actually impacted patient care. But another thing that really distinguishes Eduardo is his joie de vivre and his love of people and his sense of humor, but also his generosity. Last year, he established the Eduardo and Judith Slatopolsky Professorship in Medicine and Nephrology, and we were pleased to name Dr. Jeff Miner, the first incumbent in a virtual ceremony. You can see part of that ceremony on YouTube, which illustrates another of Eduardo's passions, which is wine. He's an enophile and knows everything about wine, but especially loves sharing it with people around the table. And we enjoyed a meal with him last night. I know Eduardo is with us virtually, and it's an incredible pleasure to um, have Dr. Cruz here to um, be our Slatopolsky lecture this year. I wanna take a moment though, to also introduce Dr. Aubrey Morrison, who is here with us. And the reason is we will be unveiling a portrait of his at the end of this ceremony and with comments from Dr. Fraser beforehand. So I hope you'll stick around for that. Dr. Morrison is the first black full professor in the School of Medicine, the first black inductee to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and his laboratory made fundamental contributions to our understanding of prostanoid metabolism. And I would just alert the trainees to a piece that he wrote earlier this year regarding his experience through the years here at Barnes and um, in Wash U. It's a powerful piece worth a read. Finally then, I am just delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deidre Cruz. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia and actually attended medical school at SLU. So she does have roots here. She's a professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the um, co-director, co deputy director of the Center for Health Equity. Her research focuses on addressing disparities in the care and outcomes of kidney disease and hypertension. She has received numerous awards as a member of the ASCI, has received the Johns Hopkins University President's Frontier Award, and she is a former National Academy of Medicine Emerging Leader. We are thrilled to have you here today, Dr. Cruz. It's been about two years coming. <laughs> I'm glad we were able to do it. The title 
of her lecture is Centering the Margins to Achieve Kidney Health Equity. Welcome, Dr. Cruz. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Humphreys, for, for that really warm introduction and for inviting me to be here and, and also for the, the tremendously warm hospitality really over um, the last day. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and, and really to come back here to, um, to St. Louis and um, particularly given um, all that he's contributed to his division and also to the field of nephrology uh, broadly, um, I am uh, quite honored to, uh, to give this lecture today that um, bears Dr. Sladopolsky's name. Um, and um, it's especially meaningful, I would say, to, for me to, to join you on the occasion of Dr. Morrison also being honored. Um, I first met uh, Dr. Morrison um, some years ago uh, when I was interviewing uh, for a program called the Harold Amos Medical Faculty Development Program, which is a program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that um, supports uh, physician scientists who are from groups underrepresented in medicine. And um, Dr. Morrison is a longtime member of the National Advisory Committee of the, um, of the uh, Harold Amos program. And that, that group sounds supportive and, and wonderful, but what they're really known for is being pretty scary to the uh, interviewees uh, when they sort of come in and, and are applying for this, uh, for this award. And so I do remember uh, Dr. Morrison being among the very, very, very few uh, friendly faces in the room. And I was, uh, it was quite um, inspiring for me to, to see a fellow nephrologist. There was the only nephrologist there. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, and, and over the years, we've gotten to interact at, at some of those meetings as well as um, uh, each year at Kidney Week. And so it's, it's, it's quite meaningful for me to, uh, to be here on this occasion. So as was said, I'm gonna be speaking with you all today about um, centering the margins to achieve kidney health equity. And I will uh, get us started. So uh, this is my disclosure information. None of the, these are relevant for our time together today. So we have a few objectives. Um, the first one will be to try to understand um, centering the margins as a framework for helping us um, think about how to advance um, health equity uh, broadly. And I will uh, focus uh, certainly on this occasion today on kidney health equity. Uh, we'll go on to recognize the profound disparities in chronic kidney disease and also some of the societal impacts of those disparities. Uh, we'll discuss um, some potential root causes of disparities in chronic kidney disease. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, how we might identify opportunities to mitigate disparities in CKD. So first, this idea of centering the margins, which I'm guessing that not very many of you are familiar with, um, but is one that um, really emerged um, out of work by Bell Hooks, um, who um, is a scholar really focused on uh, the intersection of, of gender, class, and race um, across a number of sort of um, uh, facets across society. And um, what she posed was this center margin theory. And that is that um, at the center, what we have are um, individuals who are automatically, in, in many senses, accepted into society due to their race or ethnicity, their socioeconomic status, their sexual identity, their ability, their, their primary language that they speak, their country of origin, uh, really without anything, without them doing anything uh, really to be, to be able to sort of gain that acceptance. Uh, no effort, uh, if you will, is required for them to remain at the center. Um, whereas for those at the margin, these are individuals who are not automatically included in this center uh, due to really these same factors. Um, and these individuals have to exert effort to, to be centered. And so that's, that's where this theory comes from, the center margin theory. And so especially in the context of health and public health interventions, Centering the margin involves bringing those who have been systematically placed in the margins of society into the forefront of, of our efforts. Certainly over the past now year and a half, um, we have seen really an increased focus on um, marginalized populations. And this has been brought about both by the COVID-19 pandemic and as well as high profile acts of racism that, um, that we all witness really uh, through, through videos. 
Um, and we know that these, um, these occasions have had disproportionate consequences um, to marginalized populations, including a disproportionate burden of grief because there have been, these groups have been the most affected in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality from COVID. There's also been a heightened um, fear of institutions by many of these groups uh, in large part uh, due to these acts of racism that have really led to many of these marginalized communities to, to feeling like, well, perhaps they can't trust um, some of the institutions. And then certainly as healthcare providers, that worries us that maybe they may not trust the healthcare system. And certainly that has implications for things like vaccination uh, rates. Um, we've seen um, as well care delays that have really stemmed from some of this fear um, of these institutions. And so when we think about um, the impact um, of kidney disease on those at the margin, uh, what we see uh, in kidney disease is that um, these inequities, these disparities impacting these marginalized groups are really quite profound. Uh, we know that Black or African Americans have um, 2.7 times the risk of developing kidney failure in the United States as compared to white persons. We know that Hispanic or Latino individuals have uh, 1.3 times um, the risk of developing kidney failure, again, as compared to non-Hispanic white individuals. We also know that racial and ethnic disparities are not fully explained by genetic risk variants or sort of differences in genetic factors, including uh, apolipoprotein L1, which my nephrology colleagues will be familiar with. Um, we further know that people who have lower educational uh, levels of attainment um, or lower levels of income have higher rates of chronic kidney disease. And a, a key challenge, I think, for, for, for those of us who are trying to really disseminate information about kidney disease and prevent uh, uh, some of these marginalized groups from developing it, is that nine in 10 people in, in the US um, who actually have CKD are actually not aware that they actually have it. And awareness um, has been documented to be lowest among several of these high risk, uh, in many cases, marginalized uh, populations. And so um, in addition to being inhumane, which I think we can all agree upon when we think about health disparities, health disparities are also costly and, 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 and the cost really is borne really by our society. We know that around $50 billion a year is um, spent uh, by sort of the US government um, as a result of health disparities, meaning we could save that money if these disparities did not exist. It's also been uh, documented that 30% of the medical expenses that racial and ethnic minorities in the US incur is actually due to excess costs that stem from the existence of health disparities. Um, and a, a real key challenge, and I think one of the reasons why there has been so little um, kind of mitigation of many of these disparities is that uh, the U.S. actually spends less on social services that actually might be able to help us prevent um, the uh, development of disease uh, than, than the, do, do our, many of our um, countries who have similar kind of economic uh, status as we have. And we're, in fact, the only country that spends more on healthcare services than we do on social services um, as a percentage of our uh, gross domestic product. And so while this is an, an, a fairly understudied area in kidney disease, what we know is that um, cost of chronic kidney disease care is actually pretty high, and it increases as um, we go across the continuum of chronic kidney disease with um, uh, those individuals who uh, have stages four or five CKD having uh, really, really incurring the greatest um, cost to our broader healthcare system. We also know that there are racial differences with, in terms of this cost with um, Black or African American. American um, individuals with advanced uh, CKD actually having higher costs, um, really hearkening back to what I mentioned a moment ago about that cost of disparities that has been documented. So a number of different frameworks have been put forward to help us think about um, the root causes of disparities in chronic kidney disease um, and, and how um, marginalized populations uh, have heightened risk of, of kidney disease. And this is a framework that I really like um, by um, doctors Nicholas and colleagues, because I think it really captures three large uh, kind of bucket areas that, that, that really highlight the key issues here. So on your far uh, right-hand side, what you'll see um, is um, uninsurance status or under insurance status and all the challenges that can stem from that, including of course, um, 
uh, difficulties accessing healthcare, accessing high quality healthcare. We actually know that in addition to just having trouble uh, seeing a doctor at all, people who have um, either un who are either uninsured or underinsured are more likely to not receive guideline concordant care uh, when they do get to see a physician or, or other healthcare professional. Um, and then, of course, that can mean that their risk of some of the more clinical risk factors for kidney disease is heightened. So things like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and they can go on and develop uh, CKD and also in-stage uh, kidney disease. In the middle of this uh, framework are those challenges and issues really that stem from discrimination. And from this, I'm referring to uh, chronic stress and, and the, um, the hormonal sort of factors that stem from that, uh, neurohormonal um, activation, um, as an example, um, and all of the also maladaptive health behaviors that can, can stem from the experience of discrimination. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, but certainly we know that, though, that that can lead to um, increased risk of some of these uh, other sort of precursors or risk factors for kidney disease. And then on the far left um, are those um, issues that stem from residential segregation. And here, um, what, what uh, would be important to note are things such as uh, difficulty accessing adequate housing, uh, exposure to environmental toxins, um, the, ex the uh, inability to really obtain an adequate education that would actually set a person up to have appropriate health literacy, for example. And that can then also play a role in increasing risk of chronic kidney disease. So in our time together today, what I'd like to do is highlight um, these three areas and, and for you um, cover some of what we have learned about them in the space of kidney disease. So first starting with uh, discrimination. So this is certainly a very understudied area when it comes to kidney disease. Um, uh, but my colleagues and I were able to provide one of the uh, first reports of the relationship between perceived discrimination and change in kidney function. Uh, what we did was to use um, data from the healthy aging in neighborhoods of diversity across the lifespan study, which is quite a mouthful, uh, but it uh, is the HANDLES study, which is a Baltimore-based uh, cohort study uh, that includes uh, roughly uh, half of the, the cohort are African-American, roughly half are white, um, roughly half have higher socioeconomic status, and roughly half have lower socioeconomic status. And the study was designed in that way, and, and there's also balance with respect to gender and some balance with respect to age groups as well. The study was designed in that way to really help us tease apart um, some of the key drivers of disparities in kidney disease. Uh, not kidney disease, actually. <laughs> it was, it was uh, designed in that way really to focus uh, primarily actually on cardiovascular disease, but we have um, uh, fortuitously been able to sort of tag on and do some work in kidney disease there. Um, and so um, in the HANDLE study, what we looked at was um, self-reported perceived racial and perceived gender discrimination across five distinct situations. And so those included in the setting of, of school and sort of a seeking education, uh, in the setting of, of seeking a job or employment, um, at the workplace, at home even, and also uh, in the setting of, of seeking medical care. And we also examined a general measure of um, the experience of discrimination that has been developed. And I'll give you the main finding that we had, which was that among white women, what we found was that high experience of discrimination was associated with a lower level of baseline kidney function, so a lower estimated glomerular filtration rate um, in this study. Um, and among African-American women, both perceived racial and gender discrimination were linked to a lower level of follow-up kidney function. This was after around five years of follow-up in the study. And so again, one of the early reports of this, of this link, if you will, between discrimination and kidney function, we know that perceived discrimination has been um, studied in many other settings, especially around cardiovascular disease um, and also hypertension. And we know that there, there is a relationship there uh, between, between those um, and so um, in a separate study, this was um, uh, led by Dr. Diamantides um, and colleagues who used data from the Jackson Heart Study, which many of you may be familiar with. It's um, based out of Jackson, Mississippi. And they examined um, the use of routine medical care among African-Americans um, who had a high level of chronic kidney disease risk. 
Um, so in um, over 3,000 participants who either already had uh, CKD or had diabetes or hypertension, um, they looked at a number of different factors, sociodemographic, comorbid disease burden, um, uh, healthcare access, um, and also a number of psychosocial factors. And um, what they found was that, um, that having a um, low level of trust in healthcare providers, um, having a high report of daily discrimination, um, actually were both associated with low routine medical care use. So these were people that um, if they were um, having this, this sort of view, if you will, uh, in, about providers or having this experience of discrimination, were less likely to seek out a routine medical care. So if you're kind of wondering, well, you know, how might the stress of discrimination get under the skin, if you will? So how does it, how does it actually uh, lead to what we're seeing in terms of these health outcomes? Well, I think an important um, uh, concept to, to think about is that of allostatic load. And so allostatic load has been defined as the cumulative impact of physiological wear and tear that's related to maladaptive stress patterns that can actually predispose people to developing disease. So in this figure um, here on the right, what I'll highlight for you is that um, what we know is that cumulative uh, life stressors, so things that have happened to people from the time that they were young, really across the life course, can actually have an impact as a stress exposure, can actually have an impact on their epigenetic signature, and it can lead to um, kind of maladaption in, in their, um, in their uh, in how they are balanced with respect to factors like their inflammatory um, sort of processes. It can certainly also lead to um, psychological responses to that sort of maladaption. And all, all of these factors really together can then lead to increases in risk of disease. In this model here, they were highlighting coronary heart disease um, and stroke risk, but for sure um, th these conditions share similar risk factors to what we see in kidney disease. And so in um, a study published in um, C. Jason or the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology, um, again, this was out of the Jackson Heart Study, they provided one of the first kind of looks at this relationship or this role of allostatic load in kidney disease. And I'll give you kind of the main finding here, which was that they actually found that the, um, among this population of, of Black or African Americans uh, here, they found that um, that both uh, socioeconomic status as well as allostatic load appear to sort of mediate um, some of this increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease that they observed in this, in this population. So turning now to uh, residential segregation, which is really where we'll spend most of our time together today, um, so residential segregation is, is really among the most potent forms of structural racism that we um, see both in our country, in the US, and really there are also examples of this throughout the world. Um, in the United States, a practice that um, led to what much of what we see today with respect to residential segregation was that of redlining. Um, so redlining was a discriminatory practice um, really that, that emerged at the turn of the 20th century um, in the U.S., in, in, in urban settings, settings in the U.S., um, that uh, this, this discriminatory practice by which banks, insurance companies, others that were in a position to um, provide financial backing to uh, people who wanted to either purchase a home or start a business, um, this, this practice of redlining meant that, they, that, that the loans were restricted to certain, certain communities, um, in, in particular in certain urban settings, in certain inner city neighborhoods. And they were, these, these, uh, this practice really restricted in particular the purchase of these types of things for uh, Black individuals and also in many cities there was a practice where uh, religious minorities, particularly Jewish individuals, were restricted from being able to uh, get, get loans. And so that limited where they could set up homes and also businesses. And so um, I wanna share, I, I love maps, uh, full disclosure. Um, and, so, and so you'll see a few maps today. So on the right-hand side, uh, what you'll see is um, the city where I work uh, in Baltimore. And you'll see that this is a map from the 1930s. Um, where uh, the, the area that is marked in red, that's the red lined community. So again, this, this would have been an area that 
would have been labeled as being hazardous for these, um, these banks to, to, to uh, offer loans to, whereas those areas that are marked in green were areas that were sort of um, considered the best um, places. And then the blue were these still desirable places for, for these uh, banks to, to make loans. I'm sharing with you the redlining map around the same time period of St. Louis. And I'm sure that, that, that uh, you're thinking about um, those communities and uh, today uh, when, when you sort of look at that map. So I'm highlighting again, this is the red line community in Baltimore. That star there is where the Johns Hopkins Hospital sits. And so um, I think important for thinking about redlining, again, a practice from that really started um, a uh, more than a century ago um, is that we still see the effects of that of that practice today. Um, I think it's worth noting that Baltimore um, was considered a leader, if you will, I should say in air quotes, um, Baltimore was considered a leader in this practice of redlining. And it was one of the earliest cities to adopt this practice and other cities across the country followed um, a Baltimore in terms of in terms of this highly discriminatory practice. And so what we see though in Baltimore today is that even five miles can make a, a world of difference when it comes to health. So when we look at uh, this community, the Roland Park uh, or Poplar Hill community in Baltimore, we see that around 83% of the um, population is white. There's a pretty high median household income of over $100,000 a year, very low unemployment rate, no homicides there in, in the year in 2017, which was the last available data for this. Um, a high life expectancy of around 84 years and a pretty low death rate from, from uh, heart disease. When we look just five miles uh, away from uh, Roland Park in the Madison or East End community in Baltimore, what we see is that 90% of that community um, are black or African-American. There is a very low and almost a quarter less uh, median household income compared to Roland Park. There's a very high unemployment rate there's a very high homicide rate, um, although that, that actually has improved, that 7.7 that .7 is actually down from where it was um, around five or more years uh, before this 2017 data. Um, and there is a 15-year uh, lower uh, life expectancy of around 69 years for people who live in this community, and the death rate from heart disease is quite high. And so you'll recall um, that this, I uh, carried forward uh, this um, redlined community. This is the same community that was redlined back at the, in uh, the early uh, 1900s. And so one of the things that can stem from residential segregation are um, really challenges around housing and housing insecurity. Um, and what we know is that um, uh, housing insecurity disproportionately impacts uh, in, uh, communities of color, in particular um, in the United States, both black individuals as well as um, uh, Hispanic persons and, and other uh, racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, we examined the relationship between housing insecurity and risk of, de of newly developing kidney disease. And what we looked at again, using data from the Handel study is um, we looked at this question of, um, uh, are you able to afford a home suitable for you and your family? And if an individual in the study answered uh, no to that question, then they were identified as having, as likely having housing insecurity. We found in this, in this sample that we looked at that around a third of the um, participants uh, answered no to that question and, 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 and thus had evidence of housing insecurity. And after around three and a half years of follow-up, we noted that in the overall population, a number of people developed um, either rapid kidney function decline, they newly developed reduced kidney function or GFR less than 60, they, they, a, a number of them newly developed incident albuminuria, sort of new albuminuria, and we found that housing insecurity was associated in particular with incident albuminuria, which um, we actually know the nephrologists among us will know that that can certainly be an early indication of, of, um, of kidney disease disease, and we know that people that have albuminuria are going to be at increased risk of progressing to, um, to developing kidney failure. So in a separate uh, but related study also conducted in the Handel's um, cohort, we looked at this idea of housing insecurity or instability here um, and healthcare engagement. And here we focused in on people already with chronic kidney disease, uh, a population of around 350 uh, in this analysis. We found that over a third of them had housing instability based on uh, these questions that we applied here. Um, and uh, when we then looked at 
um, what, something that we were concerned about is and hypothesized was that if people are experiencing housing instability, perhaps when they need to get care, perhaps from a friendly nephrologist, they may not actually seek out, go for that visit because they're dealing with the challenges of, of, of not knowing where they're going to be able to sleep that night. And what we found was that in this overall sample, around 24% um, uh, did report having postponed medical care when they otherwise felt like they needed it. And indeed, if you look on the right-hand side here in this table, um, after kind of accounting or adjusting for a number of different factors, we did find that housing instability was an independent predictor of postponing medical care. Uh, and this is again among people who already had chronic kidney disease. So I hope that this, this makes us think about those that we're caring for in our, in our nephrology clinics in particular. And so um, another factor that stems from residential segregation um, is this issue of neighborhood food availability. So I mentioned that uh, when in the practice of, of redlining, that um, there were restrictions around housing, but also other businesses as well, including food outlets, grocery stores. And what we see is that um, there has been this patterning of, of food availability uh, really across the United States, and it's been documented particularly in a number of urban settings. So I'm sharing with you, again, a study that was done in Baltimore led by um, Dr. Manuel Franco, who's one of our faculty at our School of Public Health. And um, every two years, um, we, have a, we have a group at Hopkins called the Center for a Livable Future. And every two years, they actually send out a team of, of enthusiastic uh, research assistants to actually go and assess the food that's being sold in every store in Baltimore City and every store in Baltimore County. And um, in doing so, they're sort of looking for healthy foods mostly and looking for whether the presence or absence of those types of foods. And I'll tell you the main finding of this particular study, which was that there was greater food, healthy food availability indicated by the larger green circles um, that was noted in those communities that were predominantly inhabited by white individuals um, compared to those that were predominantly black uh, sort of uh, neighborhoods. And um, this type of patterning has been documented, as I mentioned, really in a number of different cities across the United States. And so a number, another uh, challenge that a number of um, marginalized populations uh, often deal with is this issue of food insecurity. And so one definition of food insecurity is that it is a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. What we see in the US is that um, black, non-Hispanic blacks and also Hispanics experience a greater burden of food insecurity. And we see that that tends to spike during times of economic downturn here um, highlighted uh, 2008, the, the great recession. We know for sure that, I mean, it's been documented that here in the setting of the pandemic, we have seen spikes in food insecurity as well. I promise that I love maps. Um, so here what we have, um, is a, a map of food insecurity in, um, in really in Missouri, but also in St. Louis. So um, I'll highlight St. Louis. I will tell you when I moved here from the East Coast, it took me a while to sort out where, uh, it, you know, when I came as a medical student, it took me a while to sort out geographically <laughs> where I was located. So for the new trainees, I thought I would highlight this for you all. Um, so this is St. Louis here. Um, and this is a map from Feeding America, where what they are highlighting is um, the darker, the green, shaded area indicates a greater burden of food insecurity in these different communities. You can look at the counties across um, the state of Missouri and get a sense there. That green dot inside our, the uh, red uh, rectangle here is, is St. Louis City. Um, and it's been noted that um, uh, the food insecurity rate in St. Louis City is 18.2%. And so um, given that there is a relatively high burden of food insecurity in a number of different settings across the United States, um, a number of different healthcare uh, entities or healthcare systems have set up different programs to actually screen patients for um, food insecurity and, and then also to address food insecurity. So the majority of these systems, and this was noted in a systematic review, um, the majority of these healthcare systems used um, the, use the hunger vital signs screener questions, which um, ask within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. And it also asked within the past 12, 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. 
And if a individual patient answers in the affirmative or replies in the affirmative to either of these, that can be an indication that they are experiencing food insecurity. And in these healthcare systems, more than half of them would then take that information and track it in the patient's electronic health record. And also most of them would, were then, would then refer those patients to um, food resources, such as food banks, uh, federal benefit programs. Um, a number of systems now are having programs around medically tailored meals. So for example, if a patient needs, um, a patient is being treated with warfarin and they need a, a dietary pattern that is low in sort of vitamin K uh, sources, then they may uh, put together a set of meals for those individuals that would, would, would meet that particular need. Um, and also a number of, of systems now have on-site food pharmacies or pantries. Um, so I'm guessing that ma not many of you are familiar with food pharmacies, but these are very similar to medication pharmacies. And so in, this cases, in these cases, um, a physician or other uh, healthcare um, uh, clinician would literally write out a list of the types of foods that a uh, individual patient should be consuming given their set of health conditions. And then that person, that, that patient would then take that prescription to the on-site uh, food pharmacy and actually obtain these types of foods. There are a number of, of systems, forward thinking, I think, health, um, health systems across the country that are, that are doing this type of thing. And so what we know when we, when we look at food insecurity and chronic disease is that um, it's actually been associated with a greater prevalence of several uh, diet related or diet sensitive chronic health conditions. And these include diabetes, where what's been very extensively documented um, uh, is that people who have diabetes and are experiencing food insecurity um, are more likely to have poor glycemic control. They're also at increased risk of developing, of, of, of experiencing a hospitalization. This often occurs particularly at the end of the month. So for people who are receiving a food assistance, for example, through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, the, 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 the money from that, the, the benefit from that tends to run out towards the end of the month for many people. And then that places them at risk because now they don't have access to the food, it places them at risk of their blood sugars dropping and them ending up being admitted with hypoglycemia. Uh, we've seen relationships and it's been documented that there is a relationship between food insecurity and hypertension, um, as well as food insecurity and obesity, which um, is a notable relationship in um, higher income countries in comparison to low and middle income countries around the world where food insecurity tends to be associated in those low and middle income countries with um, frank malnutrition and, and, and certainly low weight and not, not obesity. Um, while again, understudied, uh, we have been able to, uh, my colleagues and I were able to, to provide a, a first report of the relationship between food insecurity and chronic kidney disease. And there have since been a number of different um, groups that have been looking at this more extensively. Um, in one of our uh, studies, we looked at a population of individuals in the U.S. already with chronic kidney disease. Um, this is using data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. Um, and what we looked at here was um, for people experiencing food insecurity, we compared them to those who were not. And um, what we found was that food insecure individuals were more likely to see that chronic kidney disease progress to kidney failure um, over um, nearly 10 years of follow-up uh, than were those who, who were food secure. When we, in this study, then um, uh, looked at a number of different confounders uh, and um, sort of adjusted for them in our, in our analyses, um, I think we were excited to note that we were able to, at least statistically, adjust away this relationship between food insecurity and progression of chronic kidney disease when we accounted for nutritional factors. Um, and that, uh, to us, really signaled that if there was a way to potentially intervene on the diet itself of people experiencing food insecurity, we may be able to uh, mitigate their risk of, of progressing and developing kidney failure. And so that uh, work really came around a, a similar time where what we've been seeing in the kidney disease space um, as being a number of different reports of certain healthful uh, dietary patterns that actually might be able to help us prevent uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. And some of it, my colleagues and I have been able to contribute to, um, including you know, work around looking at the dietary approaches to stop hypertension or DASH-like um, diet or DASH diet. Um, where we've seen through a number of studies that um, people who follow 
a DASH like diet have lower risk of, of um, progressing to uh, develop uh, kidney disease in the first place. And even for those uh, with chronic kidney disease who follow a similar dietary pattern, their risk of progressing to kidney failure is actually lower, at least in, in these epidemiologic studies. We and others have also done work looking at um, the dietary acid load. So um, for the nephrologists in the room, you in particular will be uh, aware that um, the kidneys handle the acid load that is really produced or presented by the type of diets that we follow with um, dietary patterns uh, rich in um, animal-based uh, proteins being uh, providing more of an acid milieu, if you will, for the kidneys to handle, whereas fruits and vegetables um, provide a more basic sort of environment. And, um, and so through a number of studies, uh, we've looked at the relationship between this dietary acid load, which when high seems to predict progression of kidney disease as well. And so with all of this kind of bubbling up, it really had begged the question, well, how can we get this, these type of healthful dietary patterns we're learning about, a DASH-like diet, one that's low in dietary acid load to these marginalized populations? And so, um, you know, in part because of my own uh, you know, background and certainly my interest, um, my work really has been around trying to center marginalized Black and, and African, uh, Black or African Americans with kidney disease risk. Um, and uh, one of the things, given that we were interested in diet, um, one of the things that our group did was to really just to, to ask people who um, we thought would be ultimately would be, would be a target for the type of um, interventions or programs that we might want to set up. We wanted to ask, like, what were their views of these challenges around following a healthy diet? Um, what we focused on, the group that we focused on here um, that I'm sharing with you were a group of low-income African-Americans who themselves had a first degree family member with kidney failure. They had a first degree family member being treated with, um, with in this case, with hemodialysis in, in all cases. And the people that we included in this um, study, they also had already a clinical risk factor for developing kidney disease. Either they had diabetes or hypertension, for example. And we asked some questions about any barriers that they perceived to uh, trying to prevent themselves from developing kidney disease like their family member um, through dietary changes. And some of the things that bubbled up out of this, uh, these focus groups that we conducted were that um, they viewed that um, healthy foods are expensive and unavailable in certain neighborhoods. It's really hearkening back to um, some of what I shared with you in those, in those maps. Um, one participant commented, uh, and what we have in our neighborhoods and most low-income neighborhoods is fast food restaurants everywhere. You hardly see a farmer's market or fresh produce stand or even fresh produce in the supermarket. And as soon as you walk in the market, the first thing you see is cakes, cookies, chips, cereal with loads of sugar, right? So they really highlighted um, some of these challenges. They also noted that unhealthy foods are more convenient uh, both to prepare and also to access. Um, and that unhealthy dietary patterns have been a lifelong habit of theirs and, and they felt would be quite hard to break. And so um, really to further understand how, um, if we wanted to try to intervene, how we might, uh, or what barriers we might face in, in helping and supporting this, this, um, this high risk group of, of, of African Americans in following a DASH-like diet. Um, we uh, conducted a sort of um, small study where we um, examined the presence of DASH accordant foods um, in the homes of uh, a population of African-Americans with uncontrolled hypertension. And um, what I'm sharing with you is sort of what we found really in, in their homes. And this was using a, a checklist that we developed. Um, and the key findings were that uh, not everyone had even a single fresh or frozen vegetable in their homes, so around 21% did not have either. Um, and even fewer had uh, fresh or frozen fruits, even fewer had low fat dairy. These are all sort of components of a, of a DASH like diet. And in fact, only 14% of the, um, this sample had uh, all of the foods that would allow a person to follow a, a DASH-like diet already in their home, right? And then uh, we also found that um, not everyone had a full-sized refrigerator or oven uh, to uh, really to facilitate the storage and preparation of these types of foods that we might advise them to eat. And I think importantly for a nephrologist uh, in particular, we actually found that younger age and chronic kidney disease were actually independently associated with lesser, a sort of a lesser likelihood or lesser odds of having these types of foods in the home. So really highlighting a particular challenge. 
Now we know that um, that was just one snapshot. It could be that these are people that eat out a lot and that, and that they are accessing their healthy foods through eating out. But we felt that this gave at least some indication that um, these types of foods may be um, a little bit foreign to some of, some of the people that we may be really trying to support. Now, um, important, particularly in community engaged work is to also um, capture and consider the assets that the population uh, brings that, that, you're, that you're focusing on. And in our case, we have done work through a, um, a qualitative research approach called photo voice, which is one where we have uh, trained a, a group of participants in the use of, of cameras to actually go out in their community and photograph their food environment. And this has actually helped us to, to, really, to, to really better understand um, what's, what's around them and, and help us to think about how, again, that we can, we can partner and help to, um, to support them in following a healthful diet. One of the participants in our, in our photo voice project, Mr. Davis, um, he has a, a garden in his home and these are some photos from that garden. And um, a quote from him, um, he said, I tried something I saw at a store at home and it saved money and it was good. It's complicated to try uh, shopping. Uh, people with cars can get around, people in the neighborhood have no access. I try to help when I can, concerns about crime and safety. If it was easier to get stuff, crime would decrease. And so he's really highlighting his, what has been his work around with this, but also identifying a number of these challenges. Um, and so um, really, Building upon what we learned um, through, through the work that I have shared with you, um, we are now finishing up, now over the next few months, a clinical trial that tries to overcome a number of these challenges. So the trial is called the Five Plus Nuts and Beans for Kidneys trial, and it builds upon a successful pilot um, intervention study that, uh, that uh, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pete Miller, led. Um, our current study is a 12-month community-based dietary intervention study uh, for um, our recruitment. We ended up with 142 uh, participants um, out of that 150 target. Not bad for a pandemic, um, but um, it includes um, 142 individuals who are largely have low incomes, and they're all African-American, and they have hypertension and albuminuria. Um, and what we're doing is testing whether delivery of nutritional advice to adopt a DASH-like diet plus $30 per week of these sort of um, DASH-accordant foods with a particular focus on potassium-rich foods um, and that are tailored to their personal choices and supplied by a local grocer that we're working with will lead to a reduction in urinary albumin excretion and also uh, an improvement in blood pressure. And so the study has um, two phases, um, and these are the kind of the two arms as well, where we have a self-directed group um, that receives just a brochure about the DASH diet, um, and they though do, do receive a gift card that is for the same dollar amount as the group that's having um, the foods uh, delivered to them, um, but in the second phase, they don't receive the gift card. Um, in the uh, coaching dash group or C dash group, we provide that $30 a week of these foods that are delivered to their homes. And they also receive coaching, weekly coaching around um, incorporating these types of foods into their diet uh, in those first four months of the study. And then in the, in the, in the final um, eight months, what we're doing is just continuing periodic calls with them to support them. So this kind of highlights the uh, phases there, kind of quickly go through those. Um, uh, and highlight our coach here, uh, providing food to uh, one of the participants. And so ours is a community engaged um, uh, study where we have numerous partners and stakeholders that we're working with, including our grocer partner. We also have a very engaged uh, community advisory board whose photo you'll, you'll see uh, there at the bottom. Um, we plan to take this work um, that, that in the findings from this study um, and use it you know, beyond just what we might do in terms of um, submitting it for publication in the scientific literature, but also to use it for advocacy and uh, around policies that, that can affect uh, the food environment. And so along with the findings of the study, we will also be using the findings of that photo voice project that I alluded to. And this, this uh, poster here really highlights um, the photo voice project. And I think some of the key things that we gleaned from that project was that these um, individuals, again, these um, African-Americans living in Baltimore uh, City who uh, all have hypertension, uh, many of them also have kidney disease, what they 
what they highlighted was really that they see this as a social injustice, this, this fact that their, their food, that, that they have difficulty accessing healthy food uh, in their community. And uh, really what we look forward to doing is partnering with them to try to advocate for improvements in that, in that environment. And so just to summarize what we've talked about today, um, disparities in chronic kidney disease are quite profound and they have significant societal impact. Some of the root causes of disparities in CKD include limited access to high quality healthcare, discrimination, and also the numerous downstream in, uh, effects of residential segregation. And achieving kidney health equity will um, certainly require a commitment to centering the margins um, by designing interventions in partnership with and, and also that draw upon the strengths and, and, and address the needs of historically marginalized communities. And so I want to thank you and acknowledge um, both the participants of the studies I presented and as well as my um, colleagues back at Hopkins, and in particular want to um, acknowledge my colleagues at the Center for Health Equity, uh, where we just last year celebrated 10 years of our center and certainly invite you all to, um, to kind of tune in virtually on some of the activities that we have there. Thank you. Cruz, that was a terrific talk. Thank you so much. I think we have some time for questions, both from the audience, but also Dr. Uh, Hicks has questions from the chat. So, Ben? That was a great talk, Lisa. And you really made the point that redlining has had these cascading effects to the last generation. To what extent does ongoing implicit or even explicit bias amongst uh, lenders, real estate agents, sellers, continue that mm -hmm. even though it's not official. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for the comment and question. Um, so I think that the wonderful thing is that now we have laws in place to at least make that not legal um, for that to happen. And that really came into place in, in the, I think it was 1963, uh, was, it was, there was a sort of fair, I think it's Fair Lending Act. Um, that uh, really at least made that illegal. Now, I think it probably still happens, but in, in the cases where a person seeking to, um, to, to obtain a loan, you know, feels that they have, have been unfairly uh, declined, they at least have legal recourse around it. And so, yeah, but, but that's a great, great question. <laughs> well, that's a great job. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Both Hopkins and Washington Horses have criticized for not engaging uh, sufficiently in the stabilized agriculture. Um, we, we were doing more here in St. Louis, I'm pleased to know. Um, can you reflect kind of on what Hopkins is doing in some of the things that you identified in that? Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, for sure. So that this is, we're not unique. So both, both um, Hopkins, um, Washington University, Several, you know, if you if you think about it and you reflect upon the larger uh, academic medical centers across the country, many of them are situated in distressed neighborhoods, right? And uh, I think that's for a whole host of reasons. So, some of the things that we are doing is, you know, we, we for sure have kind of active partnership with a number of, with with a number of community based groups. We have we have our center that is. Um, our Center for Health Equity that's focused really on research uh, work in partnership with a number of these communities so that they can actually see that, um, uh, you know, we are, we look to improve the situation, right, and to partner with them to, to improve the situation, right, so as opposed to, I think what has been long the challenge is that here we are these large academic medical centers conducting research that doesn't and, and often on these individuals, but not that does not necessarily benefit them. And we have not always historically engaged them in that process so that they have a say in even the questions that we ask, um, how we ask the question, how we go about research and, and, the, and the like. And so I think that's some of the steps. I mentioned um, food insecurity. One of the things that we are, um, our health system is now doing uh, more work around is um, is really making sure we're capturing food insecurity and also uh, do, doing some of these things that I highlighted that some systems around the country are doing around um, uh, referring people to adequate resources. We've done better with our, in our pediatric population than we have on the adult side. And so, but there's a, a new initiative uh, really around trying to improve that. So those are some of the things that we have in place. Much work to do though. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, this was awesome. One intervention that I'm community and neighborhood and urban gardening. Sure. But do you feel like that effort might inadvertently reproduce the inequalities that you brought up? 
today? So community and urban gardening. So I, I'm not, I don't think so. Um, so, and, and I want some of my work is, um, it, it, we have a recent uh, small grant, but to work with an urban farmer um, in Baltimore who has been serving uh, particularly over the course of the pandemic, um, over a thousand families who he's been providing food to them. And so I think um, the only, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to work with those types of gardens and to see more of them come up. I do think as long as the onus is not completely placed on those types of gardens in terms of uh, making sure that we have, we should still be making sure that we have ad uh, appropriate policies in place around um, what uh, grocers are stocking and, and particularly in neighborhoods where we know uh, the communities are disproportionately impacted by health disparities, right? Um, so I think we, sh I think it, I don't think it's a problem, but I think we should be doing that and uh, this work around advocating for uh, policies that can, that can also ensure um, a healthful food environment. John, do you have a question for Ms. Jack? Definitely. And again, I want to echo our thanks from everyone for you being here at a fantastic talk. Um, one here in the chat says for the 14% in your um, talk about uh, access to all the DASH diet sure. uh, available items, uh, did they, um, was there also data on the income levels of those folks? Sure. Thank, thank you for that question. So, um, so yeah, so referring back to the study where we went into the homes of um, these uh, African Americans with uncontrolled hypertension. Yes, we did have their income status, and this was largely a low income uh, population. All of them were Medicaid eligible, so they, they were being treated at a clinic where everyone you know, is Medicaid eligible. So yes, they had low incomes. Mm -hmm. uh, another question as well. Also, are policies being developed to limit the number of fast food restaurants in community colors, or are grocers with fresh healthy foods being incentivized to be in community of colors? In communities of color, yeah. So, in um, in some cities, so that's all. That's a local. That would be a local set of policies, really at a city level, right? For those types of things. And so, so you're speaking about kind of the, the the person asking question is thinking about um, kind of zoning laws about like what types of um, food outlets can be established. And um, I can say that there are a number of cities around the country that are doing things like that. They're incentivizing, for example, grocers who who want to provide uh, set up full supermarkets in um, low-income communities kind of to subsidize the, them, them uh, setting up their, their stores in those communities. And we have um, the grocer that we work with, uh, ShopRite in, uh, in, in the Baltimore area, they were a part of, or are still a part of this program we have called Baltimarket, which is a way of virtually, um, sort of a virtual shopping a program that's been set up through our city health department that allows um, people to actually use computers, even based at local libraries, to place orders to get you know, food to their home, delivered to their home. Um, and it's a subsidized program, um, really to try to overcome the fact that there are so many food deserts sort of in, the, in, these, in these communities. And so, so yes, there's a short answer. Tell us a little more sure. about the DASH diet. You yeah. know, I think this is yeah. an area where many physicians have had limited nutritional training themselves oh, yeah. and, you know, are not the best at diet and nutrition. So okay. what should we be recommending? Sure, so um, so the DASH diet. So it's a um, dietary pattern. It's not a weight loss diet. I think it's an important thing to make sure you tell your patients. Um, it is not a weight loss diet. So it's, um, it's uh, rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy foods as well. And also with um, modest amounts of um, meats and, um, uh, and also modest amounts of sweets, right? So it's, um, it is available if you're, if you know, it's a great quick uh, online search to sort of find this. It's available in numerous languages. Um, it was originally the original work that was done now over two decades ago uh, on the DASH diet was actually funded by the um, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. They have lots of information about it on their, on their website, again, in multiple different languages. But it has been shown to, the first study really showed, it was shown to reduce blood pressure. So that's the first thing you need to know more than most of the medicines that we prescribe actually. Um, um, and certainly it can work quite well in, in conjunction with uh, a number of the medications that we prescribe, particularly um, with diuretics, um, it, it, it tends to work quite well. And so, um, and then as I you know, alluded to, it is one that um, we've, we found has this at least association uh, with better outcomes when it comes to kidney disease. So yeah, <laughs> we have handouts and you can use it. Are you all an Epic system or what system? Yes. You can use an, a dash dot phrase. We have our, our fellows often use that, at least if they're in clinic with me <laughs> and um, uh, to, uh, to share that information with patients. 
That's great. John, mm -hmm. One more question. Sure, I got uh, one last one here. We uh, a lot of our residents uh, deal with patients um, that are underinsured, uninsured, and resource poor areas of our city. What can we do, or what advice would you give them to help improve the trust in our care that you mentioned as a significant barrier earlier? Yeah. So, um, so the yeah, and I think the two are perhaps related, but 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 maybe not as as directly. I mean, I think the. Um, Certainly, the lack of insurance is a is a major issue, and and I didn't have they only gave me a, a, about a half an hour today, <laughs> but um, uh, I could have talked for quite a while about about what we've seen in terms of um, when people do have insurance and not. We we actually know there's been a number of studies now that have been published looking at Medicaid expansion states under the Affordable Care Act and actually how there have been better kidney outcomes in those um, those um, states that have expanded under under uh, under the affordable care act but but so i would say at an individual level right some of the things that can be done when taking care of a patient who may um have what i really refer to as well earned distrust right because of some of the experiences that they may have had with respect to not being treated fairly by a number of systems including the healthcare system in many cases um that it really it goes back to relationship building and um, listening, and that, that's something that um, some of our work, you know, we've looked at around how you know the amount of time that doctors tend to spend with their uh, African American patients as as compared to others. That's some of the work that our um, director of the Center for Health Equity at Hopkins, Lisa Cooper, has done, um, and. Um, we also know that when it comes to conditions like kidney disease, which is complex right that um, sometimes it takes. Um, really under, engaging what a person already understands and then making sure that we're, we're sort of explaining it in a way that's accessible and, and not just using a lot of medical kind of jargon, that actually engenders trust. So the idea, so did that, that sort of um, transparency and, and providing that level of detail with people, that actually, uh, over time, that makes them trust each of, of us individually uh, more. And I think, I actually think that we can, we can all do that, right? And while we also continue to advocate for policies that may make that type of person less likely to be uninsured, right? Yeah. So Dr. Cruz, thank you very much. For <laughs> thank and, and now we have another really special aspect of today's Sladopolsky lecture. Um, part of our presence here today really is to honor and acknowledge the incredible contributions of Dr. Aubrey Morrison. Um, many people have probably noted throughout their medical training that on, on many walls of many academic medical centers, there are um, oil portraits of department chairs, hospital presidents, distinguished scholars. And I think what many people have also noticed are the vast majority, if not all of those paintings often are uh, white men um, and they reflect hundreds of years uh, worth of um, history and structural racism that, that failed to recognize or create opportunities for people of color. And in some cases, people are taking those, those portraits down and, and um, uh, you know, putting them away um, and diversifying the walls. And our approach here really is, is not to um, really remove our history, but to add to our history and to recognize extraordinary individuals like Dr. Aubrey Morrison, a distinguished physician scientist um, who was incredibly well-funded for 30 plus years and was recognized by a number of scientific awards, um, being honored by ASCII and AAP, being on the NIH study sections and the NIH council for many years, and also um, winning prestigious awards, recognizing his clinical abilities and his educational contributions. Aubrey has always been known as a meticulous, caring, compassionate clinician who was an excellent bedside teacher and also uh, was the fellowship director for many years. Um, and he, he personally has been a role model and mentor for me and for my husband, uh, who is a nephrologist for many years. So, so Aubrey helped us establish the forum for underrepresented in medicine. He served as an incredible mentor and role model and champion uh, for many of our residents and trainees of color. And he also did incredible service work by being the chair of the Research Integrity Committee of Washington University for many years. 
So he writes incredibly well and has been courageous about documenting many of the challenges he had to face as a black male physician scientist in a predominantly white environment. So Aubrey, um, I was really excited uh, to be able to commission this painting. So I'd like to have Dr. Ben Humphreys, Dr. Cruz, please join us. And, and Dr. Morrison, please come up so that we can acknowledge the, your incredible contributions uh, through, through this um, oil painting, which we commissioned um, to really recognize you. And so this will be placed on the wall. Um, very near Cromoly Dialysis Center in an incredibly uh, well-traveled location. I on in Wall Clinic in that second floor stairwell, um, so that future generations can see you um, and and see people that look like them and recognize how successful you have been. <laughs> Audrey, you want, you sure. want to say a few words? <laughs> this, this is actually a, a very emotional uh, event for me. So my long and uninterrupted association with uh, Washington University started in 1970. And um, I was on the old ward service of the old Carl Moore ward service. And it became pretty clear to me uh, within a couple of weeks of being on that service that there were none of my peers who looked like me. Um, as a matter of fact, as I learned more and more about the institution, it became even clearer that on the house staff in surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, there were no one who looked like me. And indeed, on the fellowship trainings, the fellows in training, as well as uh, the faculty, there were also no one who looked like me. So I think you will understand why it is so emotional as I stand here 51 years later to be bestowed on with one of the most uh, wonderful uh, accolades a department of medicine can, can extend to a faculty member. To have a painting uh, a portrait painted and displayed uh, for your contributions to academic life uh, in the Department of Medicine and to the medical school is to me uh, a moment I will never forget. Along that 50 year journey, I've had two or three individuals who are very committed um, to my success here who have shepherded me through the academic life in this medical center and have allowed me to achieve a degree of satisfaction and fulfillment in my medical career as a physician in this medical center. In 1974, uh, I had a meeting with Dave Kipnis at his request in his office. It was on a Saturday morning. And uh, at that uh, meeting, he offered me the job as chief resident in medicine. Considering what I had just said to you at the beginning of this talk, that was both a surprise and a shock to me. And I could only blurt out, well, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> Dr. Kipnis being a very astute gentleman, recognized that he had just rocked my world. And he said to me with a smile on his face, Think, a bit out, think about it over the weekend and let me know on Monday. Fast forward to 2020. I'm on a phone call with Dr. Frazier and she says to me, I would like to have a painting commissioned uh, for you. And I was hoping that you would agree to it. I was just as shocked and surprised <laughs> then as I was in 1974 the difference was it took me two milliseconds to say yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, because of COVID, um, my immediate family have, was never able to come to this event to share the wonderful 
pleasures of seeing this portrait on Zoom. Nevertheless, they are linked into the Zoom conference, and I'm sure that they are enjoying this as much as I am today. But when the portrait is hung, I will have the opportunity to bring my children and grandchildren to see um, this wonderful milestone and to share with me the legacy of a career from a very proud member of the Washington University Department of Medicine, Renal Division and Medical School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you